Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Betrayed her husband and left her for a friend who's more handsome and successful. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy it! Maliri stomped down four flights of stairs, cursing the fact that the elevator broke down again for the umpteenth time since they had moved in. Her hands could hardly cope with six bags of groceries, and at this moment, she would gladly kill either the owner of the house or her husband and his friends. The choice was open. She was doubly angry because she had called for help, and Steve didn't answer. She had a damn good idea why. Pushing open the door to their apartment, she flinched at the loud sound coming from the TV. The guys were listening to the pre-match celebrations and talking among themselves. It was not surprising that no one responded to her request for help in such noise. They wouldn't hear a damn thing, much less a buzzing intercom. As she hobbled into the kitchen with her load, she discovered that the counter was littered with spoiled food taken out of the refrigerator. There was no place for the bags. Throwing the groceries on the floor, she opened the refrigerator and found exactly what she had expected, eight dozen bottles of beer, or what was left. Counting the beer was not difficult, empty boxes were carelessly tossed on the kitchen table, and already empty bottles occupied another part of the counter. Her pent-up rage burst out. She walked to the closet and opened the door. The electrical panel was right inside. With a feeling of deep satisfaction, she turned off the main switch. The TV and lights suddenly went out. The screams in the living room turned to dead silence as the men realized that the television was gone. They just started about the disappearance of the game. She burst into the living room, and their attention was immediately drawn to the tension in her body and her beet red face. In the sudden silence, you could hear a pin drop. She could not resist and shouted at them, I just spent an hour at the store using my own money to buy six bags of groceries for your game today, only for no one to answer the phone or come down to help me. I had to carry all six bags up the stairs myself because the elevator didn't work. To top it all off, I discovered our refrigerator was stocked with your beer, and the food I had to pay my hard-earned money for was sitting on the counter, spoiling. You are so noisy here that I am surprised that none of our neighbors have yet come to us with a complaint. She took a deep breath. You're acting like a bunch of spoiled children, not like adults. Get off your asses and go to the kitchen. Clean it up there, put the food back where it belongs, and get your damn beer out of my refrigerator. If you need it cold, go to the store and buy ice, get a cooler, and freeze your beer in it. You can turn on the power and watch the game, but if the noise gets out of control again, I'll kick you all out. All clear? They sat there looking at her in shock. Move, she shouted, stamping her foot, and was pleased to see them scatter. Still angry, she headed to the bathroom and began drawing a bath, pouring bath salts into it. She needed some way to relax after all this. In her opinion, the guys were clearly uncontrollable, and considering that they were all already over 25 and approaching 30, this did not suit her. It wasn't that they were terrible people, on the contrary, she liked Steve's friends but sometimes they behaved as if the world did not exist except for them and what captured their fleeting attention. Games served as an example of this. If they weren't yelling at the referee, they were yelling at the coach or the idiot player who had just committed a foul. In between, they insulted each other and anyone who disagreed with their opinions. At least they didn't all live in houses yet, but they all had roommates, so they liked to hang out at her and Steve's place. A quiet knock on the door interrupted her bathing. Yes? Steve replied. I brought you a glass of wine, honey. Can I come in? Certainly, she said. He sat down on the toilet, handed her a glass, and waited for her to take a sip. We talked, and the guys apologized. You're right, we all behaved badly, and we want to apologize. The warm aromatic water calmed her down considerably. Okay, let's leave all this. Just try to stay reasonable. We'll try, and they swear that they will treat you better in the future. That's good to hear, she told him, but suspicion raged in her soul. Trust, but verify, what did that mean? She had no idea. She needed to think things through carefully. Steve and Ethan weren't bad, but the other four, the thought of having a whip in her hands and giving them a good beating made her smile. This, of course, reflected her current mood. They needed fixing. How could she pacify them in their bachelor ways, 
she wondered, taking another sip of wine. She decided to put the matter aside and enjoy her bath. As she sank into the water, she exhaled her frustration and relaxed. The alcohol penetrated her bloodstream, and she felt her muscles relax. Com found her again. Having freshened up and dressed, she decided to make peace. Heading to the kitchen, she put their treats in the oven, while she put the snacks into bowls and brought everyone fresh beer from the cooler on the deck. When she walked in with beer and snacks, she was greeted with cheers. Soon, she was chatting with Ethan while they all watched the commentators during the break of the match. Until the end of the game, everything was relatively calm, the guys behaved with restraint and tried not to make noise. In turn, she made sure no one ran out of beer, getting a fresh bottle into their hands. By the time they took their last sip, it was a happy bunch that left. Steve and her friends thanked them for their hospitality and promised to bring something other than beer next time. Each of them apologized and promised to behave better in the future. Although Mallory considered this a victory, she knew it wouldn't take long for them to fall back into old habits. If only they had girlfriends who could cuddle them, they didn't act like savages when women were around. No, they immediately calmed down. She stopped at this thought. Was it her decision to marry them all? They were all bachelors except Steve, her husband. How could she set up so many guys with girls? It wasn't like they didn't know most of her friends, so any introductions were bound to happen. No, they needed new women, women who wouldn't know how immature they are. The only exception was Ethan, others could learn from him. The next game was Wednesday night, and she was confident they would be back. They arrived on Wednesday and behaved like complete gentlemen. They poured their own beer and prepared their own snacks. They served her from hand to toe, she could get used to this. She grinned as she watched them. Inspiration struck her when she saw Joshua take out his phone to answer a text while playing. They all knew other girls, girls they may have wanted to ask out but didn't dare. They talked all the time about how this or that girl was and dreamed of dating her. They just didn't have the courage to make it happen. She could cheer them up. No, she could kick their asses, make it a challenge for them. They'll sort it out at their next game on Saturday night. After kissing everyone on the cheek as a sign of gratitude, she told them to come half an hour early on Saturday for a special moment. Of course, they asked why. She just smiled mysteriously. It's a secret, but you'll like it, she said, smiling sweetly and lying through her teeth. She spent the rest of the week thinking carefully about this idea and came up with some strict rules, no available girls with cliches. It had to be a quality woman whom they lusted after but felt was too much for them. She couldn't wait to see the look on their faces on Saturday night. Of course, she didn't let Steve know what was in store for his friends. It was time to tame these guys, to prepare future husbands from them. God knows it took forever with Steve. Five future wives could thank her later. Saturday morning dawned clear and cloudless. Sitting at the kitchen table and looking out the window, Mallory picked up a cup of steaming coffee with a smile of anticipation. Today's game was supposed to mark a new dawn in their lives. Her plans would come true, and these wayward children would have a new paradigm. She couldn't wait to see the expressions on their faces. Steve staggered out of the bedroom looking shabby and hungover. Last night, he went out to the bar with them. He poured himself some coffee, drank half of it in the first sip, then filled his cup and sat down. Here, he handed Mallory the envelope. What is this? The guys chipped in and bought you a spa day. There's a certificate for massage, steam bath, body wrap, pedicure, and manicure. They're terrified of tonight, he admitted with a grin. This pissed her off. It would be better if they were afraid. Did they really think they could bribe her, sweeten her up with a few trinkets? Okay, maybe she can be bribed a little, but it won't save their collective asses. And the spa afterwards will be a pleasant retreat to enjoy your victory. They all looked very nervous, clutching their beers, trying to gauge her mood. She thought she gave them a sweet, buttermelt-in-mouth smile, belying their screwed look in her eyes. So guys, I was thinking about last week. I appreciate what you did to get yourself in order. However, in reality, your behavior resembles that of a bunch of uncontrollable chimpanzees. Everyone looked at each other awkwardly. It was difficult to deny this truth. I had some thoughts about this. 
this doesn't happen when you have women around. In fact, you become attentive, polite, and responsive. The lewd words disappear. We need to work on this. Neither of you are dating. I want to fix this. These games would be a lot more fun for everyone if more girls participated. Heads nodded. She was right. So Jacob, you were talking about a girl you were planning to ask out. How's it going? He blushed. Honestly, Maliri, she's too tough for me. She is so beautiful. Every time I see her, I get tongue-tied. I'm afraid to even try to ask her out. What about the rest? Do you all have a girlfriend like this? Heads nodded. Maliri handed out sheets of paper. Write the name of a girl you admire from afar but are afraid to ask out. Write your name on the other side and place them in this container. With that done, Maliri grabbed her purse and pulled out the $500 in cash she had received earlier. I'm putting $500 on the line. Each of you will also pay $500 tomorrow afternoon just after lunch. You will come here and make phone calls, bring your money. Each of you will call that girl you are so afraid to date and invite her to the game on Wednesday night. We will all be here to support you. I will even get in touch and ensure that she will be here with other girls. This is a good, safe date invitation to start with. If you all contribute, the pot will be $3,000. Whoever gets the 10 dates with the intended girl first gets half. Everyone else who reaches 10 dates within 30 days will split the remaining amount. If no one wins, I get everything. Payment for putting up with your antics. Heads nodded, looking excited. Mahler wondered if they would be as excited tomorrow when they had to dial the number. She suspected not. One more rule, guys. This is an ironclad rule, you don't take no for an answer. No matter what, you keep asking until she says yes or hangs up. Got it? The heads in the circle nodded again. As Maliri had predicted, they all showed up on Sunday afternoon, looking a little scared. It's one thing to boldly talk about something after a few glasses of beer, but another thing when you're faced with reality. Everyone chipped in $500, the container was full. Okay, Jacob, you're in the game. She found his paper and handed it to him. He stared at his phone in his hand for a minute, as if it might bite him. Maliri took it and flipped through her contacts. That's her, he nodded. She pressed the button and handed the phone back to him. He was nervous when he started speaking, but soon seemed to regain his bravado. Everything was going well. Yes, you know Maliri in Steve's apartment. Yes, Maliri is here. If you want to ask. He handed her the phone. She put it to her ear and began to listen, then she started giggling. No, this will not be a sausage festival. How about throwing all those extra sausages out the window? There are only four floors here, this should teach them. Okay, see you. Ah, casual wear. I'll be in a t-shirt and shorts. They laughed, and she passed the phone back to Jacob. He wrote down some information and hung up. Yahoo, he raised his fist in the air. I got it. Thanks, Maliri, for giving me the push. One date has taken place, for Remain. Maliri watched them with interest, they looked more interested now. Okay, guys, you heard me. Spare sausages are thrown out the window. You need a date, let's go. Michael, you're starting. One by one, they picked up the phone and made an appointment for Wednesday. Maliri was delighted, her plan worked. She took out the last piece of paper, it was Ethan's turn, her personal favorite. He was shy, the shyest of all. She was worried about him since everyone else had been successful. She hoped this would give him courage. He was so different from the others. He loved to read. He loved a variety of music that others did not listen to. Something about him made her want to embrace him in her arms. Somehow, he seemed more like sirloin steak to her than the burgers and beer that everyone else, including her husband Steve, imagined. He had unknown depths that others lacked. How he ended up in this company she could not understand, however, all the guys seemed to like him. She turned over Ethan's paper and frowned, there was nothing on the back except a question mark. Ethan, there is no girl here. Don't you have a girl you'd like to date, someone you've always admired from afar and would like to date? 
He shook his head, but something in his denial made her not believe him. Ethan, you're not telling me the truth. Who is this? Come on, there must be someone. He blushed, clearly embarrassed, shaking his head again. He answered, there is no one, Maliri. He stared at his shoes, not the most honest position, as Maliri realized. Why don't I believe you, Ethan? The others started pestering him. Come on, Ethan, we did it. Be a man. Ethan looked completely miserable. Maliri was about to let him go when suddenly he spoke. Can I talk to Steve and ask him for advice? He is married and knows more about women than anyone else present. I need help. Mahler shrugged. It won't hurt to get him moving. She and Steve walked down the hallway to the bedroom. They stayed there for a few minutes, then left. Ethan is ready to go, Steve announced. Ethan turned to the window and began dialing a number. As soon as he raised the phone to his ear, Mallory's phone rang. She looked at the screen. Did Steve call? Why would Steve call her if he was standing a few feet away from her? She looked at him, he pressed the phone to his ear and nodded at the ringing phone in her hand. She really wanted to cheer Ethan up, but Steve calling her made her curious. She almost refused the call, but Steve nodded again towards the ringing phone. Why are you calling me now, Steve? She answered uncertainly. Hey, Mallory, it's Ethan. My friends are having a game night on Wednesday, and I was wondering if you would like to come with me. Her lungs stopped breathing. It felt like her stomach had dropped into her shoes. She felt faint, her ears buzzing as she listened to Ethan asking her out. For a moment, she thought she might pass out from shock, but she came to her senses. Ethan, you can't ask me out. I'm married. I asked Steve, she said. Steve said it didn't matter. You didn't have a ban on this, that's why I'm asking. Would you like to go to the party with me on Wednesday? Ears perked up when the other guys realized what was happening. They looked at Steve, who was grinning like a baboon at Mallory's discomfort. Believing that he was satisfied with what was happening, they began to mock Mallory and Ethan. Hold her, Ethan. Don't take no for an answer, your rule, Mallory. He can't take no for an answer, one of the guys said. Come on, Mallory, he has the right to do this. It was your idea, don't knock him down, another chimed in. Mallory put the phone down next to her, turning to her husband. This is wrong, Steve. We are married, I can't date another man, she said. He chuckled, clearly enjoying her misery. Why not, Mallory? It was your idea. Don't like being hoisted by your own petard? Deal with it. He asks, and according to your instructions, does not take no for an answer. Steve, she screamed. It did not help. Sorry, Mallory, but I find it funny to see you trapped by your own ideas and rules, he chuckled. This made her angry. She put the phone to her ear again. Ethan, I'd like to go with you, she said with a cry of triumph. They all stared at Ethan as he raised his hand up. Realizing that everyone was watching, he lowered his hand. Sorry, he said embarrassedly. I have a date, he said somewhat unnecessarily. Matthew suddenly spoke, just a minute. Now we have a spare sausage. Steve doesn't have a date, he can't come. Steve looked awkward. Now, aha, uh -huh, was his answer. Come on, Steve, man. You need a date, it was Michael who encouraged him. Steve looked at Mallory with a questioning look. Back to you, she said, smiling sweetly. Wait until Steve finds out that he's been cut off for the next month to die. Okay, he said uncertainly. After exchanging Ethan's phone for his own, he looked through his contact list. Mallory realized that he had given Ethan his phone number for her to answer, thinking it was him. Maybe she could go two months without because of his vile betrayal. Steve found what he was looking for and hesitated, looking at Mallory as if he wasn't sure if he should do it. It occurred to her that if he was calling a girl from his contacts to ask her out, then that said something about their relationship. Maybe this is the reason for his reluctance. Finally, he dialed the number of the person he was considering and raised the phone to his ear. Hello, it's me. Look, I need a date at my house on Wednesday night to watch the game. A lot of people will come. Would you like to come with me? 
Steve thought for a moment. No, we don't quarrel. This is the strangest situation. I'll tell you about it tomorrow at work. It couldn't be funnier. You'll laugh. In any case, everyone will be welcome here, including Mal Erie. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Let's have lunch, and I'll confess everything. Now Mal Erie had more information. This was a man he worked with who knew his voice without even asking. This said a lot, but nothing reassuring. She did not like the casual manner of the invitation to dinner. She was under the impression that this was a normal event. Agreement was also easy. It didn't seem like anyone was too worried about him being there with his wife. When everything was settled, the guys turned on the TV to watch sports channels. Stunned, Mallory walked into the kitchen and sat down at the table, staring out the window. Her cool little plan to tame these guys and move on to the next stage of life failed. She knew that Ethan cared about her. She often caught his eyes on her, but that was normal. Guys were constantly staring at her. She didn't think about it. However, it was a big shock to her that he was attracted to her. Then there was a question about Steve and his little brat. She slowly went over the list of girls she knew Steve had worked with. None of them fit the possible list except for the new one who started working a couple of months ago. Suddenly, a woman's intuition told her that on Wednesday, she would meet with her. If so, then it's time for a long heart-to-heart -heart talk with Steve. The voice brought her out of her thoughts. Ethan sat down next to her, placing a comforting hand on her shoulder. Sorry, Mallory, I shouldn't have put you in this position. You don't have to date me, let's just forget about this idea. I won't come on Wednesday, and Steve won't need his girlfriend. It got out of control. Mallory looked into his warm brown eyes, noticing the small green and golden sparkles in them. His eyes were truly amazing. He's a very nice guy, she thought, fighting the momentary urge to run her fingers through his curly brown hair. However, everything else did not suffer either, broad shoulders, muscular chest and arms tapering to perfect hips, and long muscular legs. She could tell from the slight tremor in his voice that he had put a lot of emotion into it. She found it difficult to understand why some other girl had not grabbed onto him, he was such a find. She decided that she had to be completely honest with him. Out of his kindness, he abandoned the plan she was hatching rather than see her get hurt. I put her first, something her husband was not a shining example of, she thought. She took his hand in hers and pressed his fingers to her lips, kissing them lightly in appreciation. Ethan, I like Steve's friends, but I'm glad none of them asked me out. I wouldn't want to date any of them. But if I were single and you asked me out on a date, I would be the happiest girl on the planet. Do you really think so? He asked. Mallory saw the confidence growing in his eyes. Yes, she replied. He pulled her towards him and hugged her. Thank you for this. That's not all, she said excitedly and leaned over to whisper in his ear. He threw his head back, shocked. Is it true? He asked. That's not all, she said and leaned towards him again, whispering. Finally, she leaned back and looked at him inquisitively. Stunned, disbelieving eyes nodded at her. Okay, go watch the game. Twenty minutes later, Mallory walked down the corridor like a queen. Upon seeing her appearance and the way she was dressed, a stunned Steve's jaw dropped. He muted the TV, dropping her bag on the floor. She struck a pose in the suddenly silent room, six pairs of bulging eyeballs complementing six gaping mouths. Throwing aside her cape, she showed them her swimsuit she bought from Wicked Weasel for a vacation with Steve, but it covered so little that she was afraid to wear it to the beach. But both Steve and Ethan deserved it for completely different reasons. The hiss of air being drawn in and a few mutterings told her she won. She liked it. She also didn't miss the fact that suddenly everyone was horny. What are you doing, Mallory? Steve asked. You guys were all so heated about rules, but I never made rules about when we could start dating. You just needed it to be a medium. There's $3,000 on the line, and Ethan and I are going to win it. We'll go to the beach this afternoon, and then I'll go home and get changed so he can take me out to dinner and a show I've been wanting to see. Do you remember, Steve, the one you didn't take me to? By the end of tonight, there will be two dates. Ethan and I will have a few dates before you start on Wednesday. Come on, Ethan, let's go too, she said, taking his hand and walking out, 
pleased with the growing bedlam behind them. They laughed all the way down the elevator, which was now working for once. Mallory was glad of this. She wouldn't want to go down the stairs in such skimpy clothes. I have another swimsuit that covers more if you're uncomfortable with it, Ethan. Are you kidding, Mallory? I'll be the proudest guy on the beach with the most beautiful girl. The guys will be green with envy. Don't you dare change anything, he said. How sweet, she thought, still holding his hand. They walked out into the parking lot. He had a very beautiful car, sporty with comfortable leather bucket seats. She was surprised how she had not noticed this before. It was sparkling clean inside and out. She liked that he took care of his things, and best of all, a convertible top. After she nodded in agreement, he took it off. She put on her sunglasses and relaxed back in her seat, enjoying the warm sun. He burned tires while driving out of the parking lot. She screamed in pleasure, throwing her fists into the air and turned to wave goodbye to the five pale faces pressed against the window in the apartment above. She knew they would be there. Ethan grinned as he shifted the howling transmission into second gear to hear the tires squeal. Are they watching? he asked. Oh yes, she leaned back in her seat, pleased with their dramatic departure. Several cars seemed to want to chase them, some roaring their engines hoping to challenge Ethan to a race. She wondered if they really expected her to jump out of his car and get into theirs just because it would be faster. Guys, Ethan needed his things for the beach. They arrived at a small, neat bungalow. Jumping out of the car, he promised to return soon. M looked around. It was a decent neighborhood. Small children were playing in their yards. On the next street, the roads were clean, the lawns were trimmed, and there were flowers and bushes everywhere. Ethan's house was perfect for this. The lawn was freshly mowed, and the house was recently painted. Flowers of all kinds grew in the garden. It didn't look like a bachelor pad. Does he really live with his parents, although he claims to live with a neighbor? It looked like my parents' house. Looking around, she saw no one and ran out into the street. It was a corner house with a lawn in front and on the sides. She walked down a side street, trying to look into the back of the house. Halfway there, she noticed what looked like a pool ladder peeking over the fence, and also the top of a gazebo, which screamed jacuzzi. There was also a raised terrace with tables and chairs. As far as she could tell, everything was neatly maintained, and the surrounding fence was freshly painted. She hurried back to the car before anyone noticed her. If Ethan's parents lived there, then seeing her in an almost missing swimsuit would be awkward. She giggled to herself. She wouldn't want to come home like this if Ethan's shocked parents put him under house arrest. Although she suspected she wouldn't have to go far before a hitchhiker showed up. Ethan returned a few minutes later. Nice place, she nodded towards the house. Is this your parents' house? No, it's mine. Why have we never met your neighbor? He never existed. I didn't want the house to become a party place, so I used that as an excuse. You probably make good money if you can afford to rent a house alone. It's not rented. I bought it. I worked and saved. I bought it about three years ago at a sale. It was a dump, ruins. The area was overgrown with weeds. Are you its owner? She was shocked by the unexpected news. Who did all this? I did. My father helped me a little. He's a retired builder and is always willing to give advice. But mostly it was me. But you have to keep it to yourself. You've seen how these idiots behave, and if I let them in, they'd think it was a central party every night of the week. But I don't want that. This is a quiet area with good neighbors. They appreciate the renovation work I did. You did a great job, Ethan. You should be proud of yourself. I won't say a word to anyone. She wondered wistfully why Steve wasn't more ambitious. Come to think of it, they should have already bought their own house. Her opinion of Ethan increased by about 5,000%. He had already built a nest for the right woman. She envied it. Steve still wanted to watch sports, go to the bar, and live like there was no tomorrow. Video games were his middle name. For the first time since they had married four years ago, she asked herself if she had made a mistake, married the wrong man. Back then, she expected him to outgrow some of his habits, but now that she thought about it, it turned out that this had not happened. Today, 
he still acted the same way he did when she first met him. She finally realized what the problem was, Steve was immature. That, and the unknown woman encouraging Ethan to ask her out and pushing her to do so, gave the day a more sinister tone than she had initially thought. Suddenly, her matrimonial radar flickered into the danger zone. Was Steve unhappy in his marriage? In the light of today, it seemed like a perfectly reasonable question. Arriving at the beach, she pushed all these negative thoughts aside, it was time for fun. They laid out a blanket and an umbrella. Mallory looked around, realizing that many were looking at her. Smiling at Ethan, she quickly opened the cape and threw it onto the blanket. The reaction of others was priceless. The swimsuit was a success. Hand in hand, she and Ethan went down to the water. Splashing each other turned into a water game and then a dipping competition. Mallory did nothing but try to keep the swimsuit covering her charms. Finally, fearing for her reputation, she yanked Ethan's shorts off, ending up in waist-deep water. She rushed to the blanket before he could come to his senses. They returned to the blanket, she barely ahead of him, laughing and exchanging barbs about the race. Ethan accused her of cheating, she accused him of trying to take away what little she had. An accusation he brushed aside. After all, he was a guy. What did she expect? Still laughing, they stretched out on the blanket, enjoying the sunshine. A few minutes later, Ethan stated that he needed sunscreen and asked her if she wanted to use it. She shouldn't have, she knew it was a no-no. And yet, she fell. You can apply it to any place that is not covered, she told him. It was amazing how carefully and diligently he did it. When she woke up, Mallory heard a pair of seagulls floating in the wind overhead, arguing noisily about something. Her eyes went wide when she realized that what looked like a baseball bat was currently rubbing against her fifth place. Considering her swimsuit was nothing more than dental floss at this point, he was making some progress. Ethan held her close, wrapping his arms around her, listening to his breathing. She realized that he was dozing, but despite this, in his sleep, he rubbed against her. No man had ever penetrated there, it was inaccessible. To make matters worse, the up and down movements caused his trunks to slide down. Moving away carefully, not wanting to wake him or embarrass him, she rolled onto her back, intending to pull his swim trunks back on. Her fingers were just stretching the fabric when he opened his eyes and saw that she was holding him by his lowered swimming trunks. All you had to do was ask, Mallory. I would tell you that I don't do this on the first date, he teased her, grinning that he caught her in an awkward situation. She immediately attacked him in response. You should have let the police arrest you, you pervert, trying to shove that thing up my in my sleep. Then you would be kind to me, maybe thank you, Mallory, for taking care of me and keeping me out of jail for indecent exposure. They giggled at each other. Mallory finished pulling his trunks up, snapping the elastic waistband over his bare skin, letting him know who was boss. Would you guys like to join us and play volleyball? The speaker was a young guy from a group nearby. They were just installing the net. Mallory and Ethan looked at each other and shrugged. Why not? Great, see you in a couple of minutes, he went back. You know they just want to see how I'll jump in this swimsuit. I'll have it hanging out everywhere, they looked a little disappointed when she showed up wearing a t-shirt and shorts over a swimsuit to cover her butt. The day passed very happily, and before she had time to look back, they were already driving home. Ethan dropped her off and promised to pick her up at 6 o'clock for dinner and then go to the show. The guys were no longer upstairs, and Steve sat and looked out the window. She was still very angry and walked past him into the bedroom. After undressing, she climbed into the shower to wash off the sand. Did you have with him? That was the first thing she heard when she got out of the shower. Don't be in, she chided him angrily. Of course not, and don't come at me. You are the one who abandoned me today. I did, didn't I? He admitted. I thought it was funny, Mallory. I just took advantage of what I thought was a funny situation. What's the matter, Steve? Don't you want to be married anymore? She expected his furious denial. This was not what she got. I've been having thoughts lately, Mallory. What happened today seemed to crystallize them. We want completely different things. You want to settle down, buy a house, and have children. But not me. I like to hang out with friends, 
go to the bar, get drunk, and watch sports. I like to play video games. I don't need this place to be spotless all the time. This isn't quite the right way to put it, but you're like my mother. You always grumble that you need to do better, clean up. It will never end. She was shocked by his answer. Although now that she thought about it, after today, she shouldn't have been. Her marriage was crumbling right before her eyes. So, what's your relationship with that bimbo who's coming on Wednesday night? I need to know what this girl meant to you. Don't call her that. She's a good person, just not very bright. She will perceive this as a fun evening, and it will not even occur to her that there could be problems behind this. If she hadn't been rude to her, she wouldn't have been able to handle it. She likes the same things I like. She's too young to settle down, and she knows it. She just wants to have a good time. We talk a lot at work. There was nothing else. Why didn't she know this about you before? You said completely different things when you wanted to get married. I thought this is what I want. But living this life, knowing that it would only get worse, I changed my mind. Her eyes threatened to overflow with tears. However, she was obligated to keep her date with Ethan. I need to get ready. We can talk about this later, maybe. But I don't know what time I'll be home. After your little performance this afternoon, I called her and agreed to meet her at the bar this evening. The rest of the guys will be there too. If we get too drunk, I might end up staying with one of them or hers. I wouldn't do that to you, Mollary. I need to get ready, Steve, she said drilly and, ignoring him, turned back to the mirror. She heard the bedroom door close quietly, and then the front door. He disappeared. She grabbed a napkin from the counter and wiped her eyes after crying for several minutes because of her husband's refusal. She finally decided to forget about the pain he caused. Walking over to her closet, she checked her outfits, remembering their conversation. She made a decision. Taking off her rarely worn dress, it was time for man killer a wicked weasel. This was such an outfit that it would have Ethan salivating all evening. No bra, no panties, endless cleavage from throat to navel with a single loop on the middle button, it was the only thing that kept it closed, hiding all its charms from prying eyes. She added stiletto heels to make her legs look their best. She'd worn it on her and Steve's wedding anniversary, but today it was for Ethan. Adjusting her makeup and combing her hair, she looked in the mirror with satisfaction. Ethan won't understand what hit him. The phone chirped, letting her know he was there outside. He nearly fell while trying to open the door for her. She gently closed her finger over his gaping mouth and kissed his cheek. God, he made her feel good. After talking to Steve Mallory, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. Thank you, Ethan. You look damn attractive yourself, and he sure did, dressed in a sports jacket, trousers, dress shoes, and a tie. He was a very handsome man. Looking into his brown eyes with gold and green veins, she shuddered. She realized that if it were a real date and she were single, she wouldn't have to wait until the third date to sleep with him. Feeling rejected, she would have to be careful today. It would be too easy to give in and regain her self-esteem. He helped her into the car, unable to take his eyes off her feet, much to her delight. In the restaurant, the head waiter almost clicked his tongue. Immediately paying attention to them, he led them through several tables, and Mallory enjoyed all the looks. There would be quite a few husbands in the kennel tonight, paying significant expenses for maybe, we'll have some fun when we get home, has just failed for many of them. The dinner turned out to be delicious and exciting. She and Ethan exchanged many more stories about their lives. It turned out that he had bought a second house, had just completed renovations, and was renting it out. Ethan was determined to continue buying, renovating, and building wealth. They talked about hobbies. He talked about his love of reading, music, and cinema, things she also loved. However, when she asked if he had anything else, he looked away and said no. He just lied to her. This made her wonder why. It seemed like such a harmless question to dodge. Arriving at the cinema, they stocked up on popcorn, drinks, and candy. Ethan reserved a special place for the lovers, allowing them both to sit together. She was about to sit next to him when he pointed her to the corner and lifted her legs onto the sofa. To her surprise, 
he took off her high heels and began massaging her aching feet. Those shoes made her feet look great, but after a while, walking in them was a pain. A moment later, she was already with pleasure, and his strong fingers dug into the sore muscles and soothed them. For the second time today, she was captured by his strong hands, which brought so much pleasure, should she stop him? Should have, but didn't. The movie started, saving her before he got too high. Retracting her legs, she cuddled up to him as they shared popcorn and drinks. Mallory liked the film. At the decisive moment, a tearful cry escaped her, giving vent to part of her irritation at her husband's chauvinistic behavior. Watching Ethan out of the corner of her eye as he consoled her, she noticed that a drop of moisture was also running down his cheek. He cried at a chick flick. This made an impression on her. The other guys despised chick flicks as if they'd book a cruise on the Titanic before watching it. She wiped away a tear with her finger and then kissed him on the cheek as a sign of gratitude. His support made her feel good about the shock Steve had given her today. As they left the cinema, they talked about the film. Mallory was surprised to find that Ethan had watched the movie to the end. He spoke intelligently about what happened. They agreed that one scene was too fake to be believable. However, overall, they both liked the film. The best thing she ever got from Steve when he took her to a chick flick was, is it true he didn't feel like watching? He simply suffered, often watching sports programs on headphones with the screen muted. Mallory began to replay her girlfriends in her head. How Ethan managed to avoid a serious relationship amazed her. He was just a godsend. The trouble was that she could not find a single woman who would appreciate him even approximately as much as she did. Her mind suddenly took a big step back to glare at Ethan. Why did she decide that only she finds him so attractive and seductive, as if all the women she knew weren't good enough for him? Maybe she missed something. They were friends for some time, or was she a friend, and he was carrying the torch for her? Was there something more between them? Dating while married seemed wrong, but the truth was that she was enjoying herself immensely. She wasn't going to blame herself. It was Steve and his idiocy that pushed Ethan to invite her. Unfortunately, the only reason she thought about Steve tonight was to compare his failures to Ethan's. In the car, listening to the hypnotic hum of the engine, Ethan pulled her out of her thoughts when he hesitantly asked, Do you want to come and see my house? Maybe we can have a drink. She shouldn't. It was dangerous to go home with him, but she was curious to see his house. Curiosity won. As she drove through the moonlit streets, doubts haunted her. It was madness. She was exposing herself to temptation. She was attracted to him to such an extent that she admitted to herself that she would sleep with him tonight if she were lonely. She looked at his face, alternately flashing white and dark as the moonlight filtered through the branches of the trees overhead and then hit him in the shadows. About to pull into his driveway, she looked at all his improvements. This place was a palace. The polished wooden floors gleamed, everything was modern and with the latest technology. His tastes were masculine. She swore she'd change that as soon as she moved in. Then she gasped again. Where did these thoughts come from? He led her through the house, ignoring one bedroom. What's there? she asked. Ah, just a storage room, he replied. His eyes flickered again. She looked at the door curiously. There was something behind it he didn't want her to see. The possibilities were endless, but his previous lies were about his hobbies. Clearly, he had something he didn't want to share. She made a pact with herself. She would tease or pry it out of him, even if she had to. No, she stopped right there. This was not the solution. This is the path to destruction and divorce. The backyard was beautiful. Ethan had built a pool, hot tub, and a huge deck with a barbecue for entertaining. There was a glass-enclosed extension at the back of the house, but he didn't show it. Maybe he made a solarium. More and more curious, she thought. It was closed with blinds. She couldn't look inside. Returning to the house, Ethan brought the drinks and began to settle into the chair until she patted the couch next to her. They sipped and talked until the drinks were finished. Ethan took her glass and placed it on the table next to him. She was about to say that it was time to take her home when he spoke. Mallory, I can't kiss you goodbye in front of your apartment. I'll kiss you now, he said, leaving no doubt that he was going to do just that. 
He was a good kisser, she decided, although she didn't have much choice. He pulled her closer as he made his dramatic statement, capturing her lips before she could answer him. Not that she minded. Besides, a kiss after a second date was only natural, she told herself. The problem was that he didn't stop, and she was enjoying it so much that she didn't care. Excitement flared within her. She got lost in the kiss. She could do this with him forever. He smelled so good. With some shock, she realized that her wandering fingers had managed to catch the loop on that single button and unfasten it. His hand parted the top of her dress and cupped her breast. She must stop him. She couldn't seem to pull herself together. On the second date, they were supposed to fool around a little. His free hand moved down. Wait, Mallory needed to stop this. Ethan, she said with difficulty, pronouncing his name. We need to stop. Fine, to her amazement, he immediately stopped. Sitting down, he pulled her dress off, throwing a small loop over the button. Guys didn't do that often. She had to fight them off once they got going and got her this far. She and her girlfriends told so many stories about guys who wouldn't take no for an answer. He kissed her lightly on the lips. I'll take you home. Her opinion of him increased by another 5,000%. Returning to her apartment, he turned off the engine and turned to her. Are we going to do anything tomorrow? Damn right, she answered him. I want to win this money. What's on your mind? Dinner and dancing tomorrow night. I know a great place. But tomorrow, the day will be awkward. You might not want to come with me, is it true? Why? I used to go to dinner with my parents on Sundays until we started spending game day at your place. I wanted to do this instead. As a compromise, I scheduled Mondays for lunch with them. I told my mom a little about you and what happened. She laughed and seemed to think it was funny. She wants to meet you and asked if you would like to come. But I know it might be awkward for you. Wow, boy, awkward is putting it mildly. Meeting with your parents is like board meeting to approve a new tenant, and so soon? It sucks. Still, she wanted to hit the jackpot. Working from home will help her find time. The decision swirled around in her head for a long time until she made up her mind. Okay, let's meet your parents. If anything, she was curious to know where Ethan came from. She kissed him on the cheek. Bye, then. Talk to you tomorrow. I'll pick you up at 11. Ethan leaned back in his chair and watched as her gorgeous sank into the lobby. He needed to have his head examined. Why the hell was he dating a married woman? He asked himself. It couldn't lead anywhere. He was emotionally torn apart by wanting her. She had been his secret crush since the day he met her. For a moment, he regretted taking Steve's advice and getting them into this situation. There was nowhere to go, but he couldn't bring himself to leave her. As she disappeared into the elevator, he turned and stared at the moon through the windshield. The situation seemed so hopeless. He sat and meditated, watching a long, thin dark cloud pass over a glowing ball in the sky. Somehow, he associated this cloud with her marriage. No matter how brightly Mallory shone for him, her marriage overshadowed his desire. The dazzling relationship they could have had dimmed like moonlight. A tear involuntarily ran down his cheek. Upstairs, Mallory washed her face, throwing on the long t-shirt she usually wore to bed. She walked to the window to see if Steve's car was back yet. They needed to talk. She frowned when she noticed Ethan's car still parked downstairs. She saw him go limp in his seat. He didn't seem to be on the phone. She watched him for a while, becoming concerned when he stopped moving. Ethan winced as the passenger door opened and Mallory climbed in. Inside, he saw her t-shirt and robe hanging loosely from her shoulders. God. Then he noticed her quirky little bunny ear slippers and burst out laughing. What? He pointed to her slippers, still laughing. She slapped his arm. Don't you dare make fun of my slippers. Warm feet are happy feet, and happy legs mean a happy woman. Just wait until I press my cold feet to your back so that they will warm up when we are in the... Her brain grasped the importance of the fateful statement that came from her lips. She blushed. I mean... Ethan tried to keep a straight face, but then they both burst into laughter. Why are you still here? 
Mallory asked a few minutes later, when they could look at each other without hysterics. I asked myself, why am I putting you, Steve, and myself in this situation by dating you? This is so wrong. This will get us nowhere, she thought about it. After Steve's message this afternoon, she didn't have much hope for her marriage. But, on the other hand, she did not want to break up because of one stupid statement. Maybe Steve will regret it and apologize. Or maybe not. She suspected that Steve was telling the truth about his feelings, but she shouldn't have given Ethan false hope by making him think her marriage was on the rocks. But I must admit, once we started dating, I didn't want to stop, she pulled him towards her and gave him a searing kiss. Sometimes, Ethan, we are closer to our goals than we think. With this ambiguous statement, she got out of the car and headed home again. Ethan laughed again at those bunny ears fluttering around as she walked into the house. As if she had read his thoughts, she turned and pointed at her slippers, wagging her finger at him as a no-no. Don't insult my favorite slippers, he tried not to laugh at the funny sight, an intimate look at her quirk. Little did she know that the thought of her being in bed with him, cold feet or not, was like Christmas, Easter, and a birthday for him. On the way home, Ethan kept replaying her ambiguous message in his head. What exactly does it mean? The headlights washed over his face, and he winced at the squeal of tires and the angry horn of an enraged driver. He was almost hit by driving through a prohibitory sign. He pulled over to the side of the road to give his racing heart time to slow down. Damn, that was really close. It was time to get back into the game before he committed suicide. Upstairs, Mallory looked out the window again. Ethan had left, and there was no sign of Steve yet. She poured herself a glass of wine and curled up on the sofa. The future that Steve had given up was non-negotiable in her books. Children, buying a house, all this was a typical development of marriage. Children were high on her list of priorities. If Steve had stated this at the very beginning, they would never have made it to the altar. They dated for a year and were married for four years. Had she wasted all these years on the wrong man? Thinking about Ethan, she wondered if he was just attempting consolation for the hurt Steve had caused her. But when she thought about it, she realized that they had both been drawn to each other ever since he came into their lives about three years ago. In the last couple of years, this process has only intensified. When the group went camping, he and Ethan always seemed to walk together, talking as they watched the game. She seemed to be sitting next to him. He was the one who regularly got up to help her bring snacks or beer. He helped with cleanup after games or volunteered to do small errands while packing for parties. When they went to bars, she almost always sat next to him, talking and watching the others joke. In fact, she realized, in all the time they had been together at the bar, she had never seen him drunk. The others sipped their beers as if their goal was to get drunk and act like idiots. Ethan sipped his beer and rarely exceeded two glasses. Three seemed to be his absolute limit. If she was cooking in the kitchen, Ethan would seat at the table and talk to her. He readily jumped up to take dishes out of the cupboard, crush potatoes, or provide any other help she needed. After thinking about his sensitivity compared to others and the things he liked, she had to admit that the two of them had a lot more interests in common than she and Steve did, or anyone else for that matter. It wasn't a rebound. Ethan was by her side the whole time. She looked out the window again. There was still no sign of Steve returning home. Angry, she texted him, we need to talk. Usually, she received quick answers. But as time passed, the silence on the phone seemed deafening. The phone beeped, notifying her that Ethan was outside. She checked her eyes one last time in the mirror. They looked better now. Steve didn't come home or answer her last night, and she cried for half the night before deciding he wasn't worth it anymore. A feeling of bitterness arose in her soul, which pushed her away from him. She spent the morning agonizing over what clothes to wear to meet Ethan's parents, bathing her eyes in cool water with cucumber slices to reduce the puffiness and bags underneath. On the way to his parents' house, she felt uneasy when she realized that they were going to an upscale area of the city. Ethan drove until he pulled into a gated driveway and clicked the remote. Mallory was stunned. She knew this place, like many other people in the area. She had driven past the mansion many times, admiring it and dreaming of one day being successful enough to own something like it. They drove down the long driveway until Ethan parked under a canopy. 
Mallory looked around. God, this place was worth millions. She didn't expect this. Inside, she was introduced to his parents, Barbara and Victor. Let's go, Mallory. Let's go to the kitchen. I'll bring us a glass of wine. The boys have some plans, Barbara said, leading her through the house. When Mallory's eyes caught something familiar, she exclaimed, My God, is this a reproduction? No, this is the original, Ethan's mother replied. Several years ago, Mallory was at an art exhibition and was mesmerized by this painting. The $50,000 price tag on it was only $49,000 more than she could afford. Still, she hoped that someday she would be able to splurge on it. His parents must be very rich to be able to spend that kind of money on one painting. Do you mind? She asked, wanting to admire the picture again. Of course not, dear. This is what art is for. Enjoy, watch as much as you want, Barbara replied. Several years ago, I was at an art exhibition and was completely delighted with this painting. True, I couldn't afford it, she admitted to Barbara. Looking around, she saw many paintings signed by the same artist, and then it dawned on her. Her name was Barbara, and Ethan's last name was Evans. All paintings were painted by Barbara Evans, Ethan's mom. She turned in stunned amazement. Oh my God, you are Barbara Evans, the world-famous artist. Well, I don't know about world fame, honey. I just draw, and if people like it, I don't hold it against them if they live somewhere else, Barbara shrugged, then looked surprised. I take it Ethan didn't tell you anything about us? Typical, but this boy is so determined to succeed on his own without people giving him what they would if they knew who his parents were. I have to admire that. On the other wall, Mallory noticed another painting. It was completely different in style from Barbara's paintings. The colors were rich and vibrant, and although she didn't know much about art, the artist's talent shone like a beacon. Oh my god, this picture is beautiful too, she exclaimed. Yes, it is. Do you like it? Barbara asked. Mallory nodded, studying the picture. This is incredible. Come with me, Mallory. Looks like you have a taste for good art. We have a room in which we keep the best paintings. There is another painting by this artist that Victor and I consider very special. I think you'll like it. They walked down the spiral staircase and stopped in front of a steel door. Barbara entered the code into the lock. Give me a minute, Mallory. I need to adjust the lighting. Don't peek in advance, she laughed. Mallory took a moment to look around the basement. It was beautifully decorated and equipped with a sports bar and large screen TV. The room was decorated with comfortable chairs and bar stools. Behind the bar was a collection of liquor that rivaled any bar she had ever been to. Barbara slipped out of the room. Okay, Mallory, she said as she pushed the door. Her portrait hanging on the opposite wall flickered, reflecting the light of the spotlights that emphasized her appearance. Stunned, Mallory stumbled into the room and fell to her knees, pressing her hands to her cheeks. Shocked eyes stared at the magnificent picture. No one needed to explain who this artist was. Ethan, she whispered, overcome with emotion. She remembered this moment well. Their small group went on a hike. There was a hill along the path adjacent to a vast, gently sloping meadow filled with colorful flowers. Joshua, Matthew, and Jacob spent the entire hike throwing barbs at each other. Matthew jumped on Jacob's back, and then Joshua knocked them both down. She, Steve, Ethan, and Michael watched with laughter as the three of them rolled down the hill, crushing flowers and imitating a fight. She was amazed that no one was stung by the horde of very angry bees, which they interrupted by buzzing angrily at the playful fighters. It was a wonderful day and her participation in these fun moments is now captured on canvas. She didn't know that Ethan had taken the photo. He captured her from a three-quarters angle, laughing happily at the playful trio and their silly antics. The day was sunny, a light breeze ruffled her hair, removing it from her face. Soon after, they spotted a bear crossing the meadow, her two cubs frolicking among the flowers. Snarling at the angry bees, every now and then, not wanting to get into a confrontation, they quietly left, turning back and taking a different route to avoid the bear. It was an amazing picture. What is even more important for her is that in every stroke of the artist's brush, 
his love for his muse was evident. Understanding dawned on her, Ethan loved her, and these feelings burned in his masterpiece. His name sounded on her lips again, and tears ran down her cheeks. She heard rustling footsteps and looked over her shoulder. Ethan and his father stood in the doorway. Ethan's uncertain eyes widened with the realization that his secret feelings for her had been exposed, and he had no idea how she felt. Mallory didn't remember how she stood up or crossed the distance between them. All she knew was that he was holding her in his loving arms. Her lips found his, and the outside world ceased to exist. They returned to the ground, their eyes flickering back and forth, looking intently into each other's eyes, searching for the truth in them. The intertwining of their hearts spoke for itself. With a groan, she buried her face in the crook of his throat and lovingly buried her nose under his chin. It took her a few seconds before she realized there were tears streaming down his cheeks. She wiped them away with her finger and kissed him tenderly. Ethan, she sighed. How could she not notice her true feelings for him for so long? He loved her. Kissing down his jawline to his ears, she shared her heart with him. I love you too, with an ecstatic sigh, he hugged her tighter. Mallory heard quiet voices, his parents, embarrassed, she turned to apologize. I'm very sorry, she apologized to his parents, pretending to be busy discussing her painting. Barbara turned and smiled at her. Don't be sorry, Mallory. This is one of the most sincere moments I have ever seen in my life. I think I speak for both of us that we are lucky our boy was a part of it. His father nodded in agreement. Why don't we go have lunch? Barbara suggested. Over lunch, Mallory talked about the dating situation, especially the fact that Steve had just dumped her. Wanting Ethan to know the truth, she said that Steve had suddenly abandoned all the decisions they had discussed when they were first dating and getting married, that he wants to leave to be free to have fun, drink, make a mess, and play video games without the supervision of mom. She still felt insulted by the use of the term. His immature behavior made her decide not to stay married to him unless she had children and bought a house in the future. Judging by his refusal to come and discuss the situation, she suspected that divorce was the only solution. She also explained her sudden realization that she and Ethan had been gradually growing closer over the past few years. She just didn't realize it. After that, she decided that lunch had gone well. Ethan's parents seemed supportive as she explained how events unfolded surrounding their son dating a married woman. Barbara even expressed hope that things would work out between her and Ethan. She was invited to return with Ethan at any time. They held hands the entire way back. Steve's car was in the parking lot when he dropped her off. Do you want me to get up? She asked. No, it will be better if we settle everything with him. Okay, I'll pick you up at 7 o'clock. I'll be ready. Going upstairs, she poured herself a glass of wine and sat down in the living room. Steve was sitting there with a beer. I see you finally returned home, she said. Sorry about that. This was bad behavior on my part. I shouldn't have done this after your little lecture the other day. I don't see that there's anything left between us. What you said makes no sense in any marriage I have, and frankly, if you had said those thoughts in the first place, we would never have made it to the altar. Steve, I know. Mallory, I started having these thoughts a couple of years ago when I finally noticed how much you and Ethan were into each other. At first, I was jealous, but you didn't seem to notice what was happening. Of course, you didn't cheat with him. I didn't even notice any signs that you were unhappy. It made me stop and think about it in a different way. Was I happy? Were we in harmony with our desires in life? My answer was no, but I realized that it would be a big yes for you and Ethan if you ever allowed yourself to be with him. I didn't miss the way he looks at you, and I know he's crazy about you. I knew you wouldn't be happy if I expressed my new feelings, so when he came to me with his dating dilemma, I deliberately pushed him towards you. Were you jealous? Why didn't you say anything, Steve? I never set out to make you jealous. I knew it disappeared when I realized that you didn't even realize how you ended up together all the time. Do you know that you touch each other like lovers without even realizing it? What? How could she miss something so personal? Yes, small touches on the arm, back, legs when you sit together. At times, you both are completely oblivious to the others. 
One day, you reached into the back pocket of his shorts and pulled them closer while the two of you looked at something. Another time, you ran your fingers through the hair at the back of his head. What? She was amazed she didn't remember doing this. Yes, everyone else noticed, that's why bringing you and Ethan together was a smart decision, Mollary. You would never accept my changes, and I must admit I don't want to remain as I am. It's just not me, we need to move on. Wow, much more than she expected. The part about Ethan shocked her. She had already realized that they were circling each other, but obviously, things had gone much further than she thought. Their body language, the way they unconsciously touched each other, spoke volumes. I'm shocked, Steve. I never intended to do anything with Ethan, and I certainly didn't want to humiliate or diminish your importance. I didn't even imagine that I was doing such things. Listen, the guys are all excited about Wednesday night. I want to keep everything a secret until the end. Let them have fun and maybe come away with a new relationship. We can do it. Of course, I want the same for them. What about your little office, sweetie? He looked embarrassed. I really like her, and in the future, she's perfect for me. Considering the state of my mind right now and in the future, who knows? Please be kinder to her. Mallory needed to leave before the tears came. No matter what the future held, she loved Steve, maybe not as much as she thought at first. Okay, Steve, let's talk about this after Wednesday and agree on a separation. Now, I have to go get ready to meet Ethan. We are going to walk. Me too. Hey, we're only one date behind you. You better hurry. I lost my enthusiasm for the bet, the guys can share it. I don't care anymore. Even though she had to nurse her red eyes again from crying, she was radiantly happy that night at dinner with Ethan. They danced and had fun all night. For the first time, she realized that as crazy as it all seemed, she belonged in Ethan's arms. When the evening ended, applause rang out from the audience. She and Ethan looked back and realized that the music had ended, leaving them standing in the middle of the empty dance floor, completely lost in a heated kiss. At first, Mallory thought they were clapping for the group, but then she realized that everyone was looking at them and clapping. Following this, several wolf whistles were heard. Now, that was a little awkward, they went back to Ethan's for a nightcap. Walking through the door, Mallory took Ethan's hand and led him to the bedroom he had refused to show her earlier, the one with the outer glass part. She had a good idea of what she would find there. Open it, she demanded. Of course. What was inside was exactly what she expected to see. Ethan built himself a studio, adding a glass extension to improve the lighting. There were several portraits of her taken during various events in which they both took part. The most amazing thing is that his love for her was evident in all these paintings. He was a talented artist like his mother and was inspired by his secret love. Mallory wanted nothing more than to get him into bed and stay the night, but she and Steve had an agreement. Nothing will happen until they break up and one of them moves out. They hugged each other on the couch and kissed lightly before deciding it was getting too hot and heavy. They needed to stop while they can. Wednesday night was not well thought out. The addition of additional girls has exceeded the number of places available. Luckily, no one objected to sitting on their partner's lap. Mallory was sitting on Ethan's lap, and Steve was holding his little Ashley on his lap. As much as Mallory was ready to be angry with her, she found that she enjoyed his date. Steve warned her that his colleague was not very smart. This became obvious when Mahler got the chance to talk to her in the kitchen. However, she was cheerful and so happy to meet them all. But looking at her face as she buried herself in Steve's arms, there was no doubt that she was crazy about him, and he had nothing but adoring eyes for her. Despite the sadness that their marriage was over, she couldn't help but admit that everything was working out for the best for everyone. The evening went well and ended with Friday dates for all the guys. Things were looking up, their behavior with the women around them has definitely improved. Steve left to take Ashley home, and Mallory kissed Ethan goodbye at the door. She began to get ready for bed, surprised that Steve had not returned yet. When she got up at 3.30 to go to the toilet, he still had not returned. Mallory woke up at 7 to find Steve there, sprawled on his side, completely drunk, a cloud of alcohol fumes hanging over his head. His shirt was removed, and his pants pulled down to his knees. Before he lost consciousness, she shook her head, 
then took off his boots and the rest of his clothes, including his boxers. She stared at his groin in shock. She wondered if she had overdone it. It all started when she taped several of his hairy body parts to the bed. As her anger grew, so did the amount of tape, until Steve was an almost faceless lump under the gray film. She pulled the tape all the way to the wooden sides of the mattress. Without outside help and long, painful hair pulling, he could not get out. His head was taped to the pillow, the crowning achievement of her revenge being the wedding ring glued to the top of his dignity. A single, solitary diamond towered above everything else, glinting in the light. His bladder was going to be in serious pain when he woke up from the beer he drank last night. She hoped it would really, really hurt. When she finished, she took his phone and took a video of her revenge. Collecting all his contacts into one message, she sent the video to everyone he knew with the title he cheated. Ethan called her a few minutes later. He picked her up and took her home, and she had to pack her suitcase. She decided that she would wait a few hours and then text Ashley about the location of the apartment key. She would be able to come and save her lover. The moon was a bright ball in the sky, moonlight streaming through the bedroom window when Ethan screamed and jumped off the bed, his bare feet slamming loudly on the floor. Oh my god, did you put those feet in the freezer before you went to bed? Giggling, Mallory rolled over and wrapped herself in the warm blankets, her belly rapidly swelling. There's no way in hell her new husband will ever insult her favorite slippers with bunny ears again. All that remains is to teach him to do this fantastic foot massage every evening without asking, she sighed. It took so much work to train my husband. However, warm, happy, well-massaged feet meant a happy woman, and a happy woman meant a happy wife. He will learn. Subscribe to our channel so that your second half doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. What do you think of our story today? I think the wife did the most wrong thing possible to her husband, if I were in his shoes I wouldn't have let it be done to me the way it was done to today's main character. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. Until new videos.